from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Thanks for tuning in. Mike's side during our first half hour today, K-State's Jeff Whitworth. He'll take a look at numerous insect pests currently active in our Kansas crop fields and offering advice to you growers on making insecticide treatment decisions and other management considerations. Specifically, Jeff will address armyworms and cutworms in newly seeded wheat, potato leaf hoppers in alfalfa, sugarcane aphids and chinch bugs in grain sorghum, as well as stem borers and bean leaf beetles in soybeans. Jeff will cover all of that with us next. And further ahead, we'll hear once more from K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. He brings another stop, look, and listen. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you aboard. Well, crop producers, we've a host of insect considerations yet for you to think about and possibly manage for finishing off this growing season. Bringing those to our attention now is crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth of K-State Research and Extension. Surprisingly so, Jeff, there's a lot going on out there. And let's start with that new wheat that's going in the ground. It's being dusted in in many a location around Kansas. And you don't want producers to lose sight of possible insect troubles there. That's exactly right. And thank you for having me. You do think it will rain again, right? I mean, it always so. has in, in years past, but it does seem to have turned off really dry and dusty in the last few weeks we still need to remember we have a lot of volunteer out around the state in those patches that have not been planted, and volunteers somehow seems to be really good at not needing much moisture um, so that it grows. The volunteer wheat needs to be actually killed out at least a couple of weeks prior to that new wheat germinating. Now, I know unless it's going to rain, we probably have some time, so it's a great time to kill the volunteer. The very next chance I saw of having some rain is next week. So if you get out and kill it now, that'd be ideal time. But there's still a lot of volunteer wheat. A lot of it's pretty thick. And in that volunteer, that's what we call the green bridge. That's where most of our pests, whether they're diseases or insects or mites, that's where they carry over from the spring when the wheat was still green until the fall when we plant wheat again. It's very problematic to try and get rid of. I understand that. But you at least need to try and get rid of it two weeks prior to the germination of the new crop. In the volunteer that I've seen this year so far, there's hessian flies, wheat curl mites, and those are two of our bigger problems that we have every year. Also, I've been getting a few calls about armyworms. Now, armyworms and fall armyworms, they can be a problem of the newly planted wheat. And what we've seen the last few years is the Kansas highway department or whoever have been seeding a lot of the new construction with some grass seed just to hold it down so it doesn't erode. And in that grass, a lot of times we've found armyworms or fall armyworm infestations. And once that seeded grass dries down, then the wheat's there and they move over into the wheat. Armyworms and fall armyworms, we don't think they overwinter in Kansas, so they're only going to be a problem, hopefully, until we get a, not just a frost, but a freeze. It needs to get down into the mid-20s in order to uh, alleviate or eliminate the armyworm problem feeding on new wheat. But right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen for a couple of weeks, and we're starting to see armyworms. The treatment threshold, again, is it fluctuates quite a bit based upon the health of the plants and a lot of different factors. But right now, if you have five, six, or seven 
small army worms or fall army worms per square foot, and they're feeding on the on the wheat, especially during right now when it's stressed or it's dry and it's struggling anyway. You might consider a an application of an insecticide. Um, there's a lot of different insecticides that are registered. These worms are right up there on top of the ground and they're feeding, uh, so they're not that difficult to kill. Sometimes they're difficult to find uh, because they'll be feeding early morning, late evening, or in the evening, uh, and then they'll hide under the stubble or someplace at, uh, during the day. But they'll be there, and you can see because they actually they're feeding on the plant itself. They're not feeding on the root system. Uh, they're feeding on the plant, and they're they're destroying the plant. Would they be evident, though, before emergence of that wheat, or are you, are you going to have to wait no, for you, that wheat to sprout? Before? Yes, you got to wait till you have a stand of wheat there. Okay. But that brings up another question, because the armyworm or the fall armyworm, we can have another one or even two uh, generations this fall up until the point in time as it gets too cold. And that, like I said, it's not just the first frost, it's the first freeze. It needs to get down into the mid uh, you know, the mid twenties for a couple of hours. And once it gets down to that level, that will mitigate army worm or, or fall army worm problems. Now, one of the caveats to that is if there happens to be army cutworms out there. And last spring, we had a pretty good army cutworm infestation in alfalfa and wheat throughout the central and the and the western part of the state. Army cutworms, the moths are here now. They're laying eggs in wheat and alfalfa or any grass or any plant that's green. Those eggs will hatch in the next two to three weeks, and those larvae will start feeding on the wheat or the alfalfa or whatever the eggs were laid on. Generally, we don't see that infestation until the spring because as the larvae are small, they don't consume that much. So you need to get out, and if you do find some small worms, make sure you... uh, look and try and get them identified as to whether they're army worms or army cut worms or fall army worms because army worms and fall army worms will go away after the first cold weather. Army cut worms won't. They will overwinter as small larvae right out there in that field. And then they'll every time the temperature's over 45, 50 degrees, they will feed all winter long. And so in the spring then, that's when we'll see the majority of the feeding. That's where we'll see the majority of the problem, just like we did back in, you know, March or April of this year, when a lot of acres were uh, actually damaged, a lot of acres were actually sprayed for army cutworms um, that were, the eggs were deposited in the fall of 2019, just like they're being deposited right now in 2020. So those are what we need to look for. But number one, you need to get rid of the volunteer. If you don't have any volunteer out there, you won't have any army cutworm eggs in your wheat either, unless they come in and lay it after the crop has has germinated. And if one is not sure about making that distinction between the army worms, fall army worms, and the cutworms, why they can turn to their local extension agricultural agent or contact folk here at K-State to help out with that identification. Jeff, you say also that you are seeing a a proliferation of potato leaf hoppers in alfalfa stands now here in the late going. Yes, uh, as you know, there are two crops right now we worry about uh, as far as still green, alfalfa and wheat, as we just talked about. There are massive amounts of potato leaf hoppers, at least throughout south central and north central Kansas, in the alfalfa. And the potato leaf hopper, uh, first of all, you know, we're right on that borderline whether you're going to swath your alfalfa now or you're going to wait till it frosts or what you're going to do from a management standpoint. But if you have potato leaf hoppers and the treatment threshold very, very small and one per like 10 sweeps of a net, which means it doesn't take very many to cause a problem because the potato leaf hopper, they suck the juice out of the plant. As they're sucking the juice out of the plant, they're inducing or they're adding a toxin into the plant. And characteristic uh, feeding damage is a yellow color starts out on the tip of a leaf uh, and it kind of moves down the leaf and then it can move down the, the stems all the way down to the base of the plant if the feeding goes on uh, long enough. And this is called hopper burn when it first starts out. It can be kind of a coppery or a, a yellowish color. But what it's doing is killing the foliage in this case. And if that feeding goes on too long, it can really hurt the plant 
as far as overwintering goes because, you know, from now, what, for the next month or so, the plant's using the foliage to put nutrition into the roots for over overwintering. And if the top part of the plant's killed, it's not going to have that transport of those nutrients into the roots. So there's a lot of potato leaf hoppers. They don't overwinter in Kansas. At least we don't think they do. The last couple of years, we've seen them stay in Kansas up until the middle part of November. And therefore, you need to get out and monitor your your alfalfa. Probably the easiest way to treat for potato leaf hoppers is to just swath it or just uh, cut your alfalfa. They have to have live plants to suck the juice from. They won't live in um, baled alfalfa. So if you swath it, you're done with them. But you can treat. You can spray them. They're easily killed. Everything we've ever used at the lowest rate that's labeled for potato leaf hoppers has done a really good job of controlling them. But then again, if you do that, you got to look at the post-harvest interval, how long it is from the time you treat it until you can actually swath it or harvest uh, the alfalfa. So our best recommendation is if you have them and you are close to cutting, just go ahead and, and harvest it or swath it if you can. Hopefully, they will be moving out. Hopefully, they won't cause too much more stress on these plants. But I'm just saying if it doesn't, you're looking at the temperature for the next two to three weeks, it's looking like it's going to be pretty warm. Right. So I'm guessing these potato leaf hoppers are going to continue in the uh, alfalfa and continue to feed. So that just keep that in mind. There's a lot of them around, and unless it starts getting colder, they're not going to go away. So you might have to think about swathing a little bit early or maybe uh, treating them with an insecticide if that fits your management scheme the best. Well, a good heads up for you alfalfa growers there. Jeff, if you'd stand by for a few minutes, we'll get back to the row crops, see what's going on in the late stages of the growing season that producers still need to tend to there. We're talking with crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension, on this Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now, as our guest is Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension, and he's sharing notes on a whole collection of insects that are still getting after it out there in our crop fields, even this late in the going this season. And to the row crops, Jeff, and our grain sorghum producers are still observing sugarcane aphids out there and wonder if they're going to be a harvest time worry. That's exactly right. Uh, I've been a lot of different places in South Central and North Central Kansas over the last seven to ten days. There's quite a disparity in the stage of development of sorghum from here to there. You know, there's a lot of sorghum that was planted really late, double crop sorghum, and there's a lot of sorghum that's being cut, you know, already. So it depends on where you are, but in the later planted sorghum, the sorghum that still has green leaves at least, in just about every field we stop to look in, and that I've gotten calls from consultants, there are sugarcane aphids still. Sugarcane aphids are still migrating into the state, which is no surprise. They have in the last couple of years. They continue to migrate in. Sugarcane aphid is a tropical or a subtropical aphid, so they like warm weather. As soon as it gets cold, we shouldn't have any worries about sugarcane aphids anymore, but they are continuing to migrate in. So if you do have a late planted field and you don't have any beneficials in that field, or there's very few beneficials, uh, you probably should still monitor for sugarcane aphids. The easiest way to find them, I've found, is if you see a, a little cluster or a little group of beneficials, green lace wings or surfed flies, or you see leaves that have what looks like syrup on them. If they're syrup, that's the honeydew 
the, the sugarcane aphid colonies produce gross quantities of honeydew. But if you look, it'll be on the leaves underneath where the colonies are because the colonies will generally are on the underneath side of the leaf and that honeydew will, will leak down onto the leaves below. I think that's probably what attracts a lot of the beneficials. Uh, anyway, they have done a really good job this year and last year, at least that's what we attribute it to, of helping to control sugarcane aphids. These aphids continue to come in. They reproduce parthenogenically. The females, as soon as they land on a leaf, they start producing babies, little nymphs, and they're females. And, you know, a week later, those babies are producing females. And so those colonies can just explode very quickly. And if there's no beneficials there to help control them, that's where we have a problem. But fortunately, the last two or three years, we've had pretty good populations of lady beetles, green lacewing, surfeit flies, and others that have helped control the sugarcane aphid. Uh, at least that's what we attribute it to because in, in 2015, 2016, sugarcane aphids were really causing problems. And that's the first two years that we really have ever dealt with them. But since then, every year, they continue to come in and they continue to try and colonize. They just have not been able to. This year, 2020, we probably had as little spraying of sorghum headworms or corn earworms, whatever you want to call them, the worms that get in the head of the sorghum plant and feed on the kernels or the grain. I did not hear of anybody, nor did I see anybody spray uh, sorghum for headworms. That helps with the beneficials right. because every year we've had the the problem of do I treat for the headworms, when I know I'm losing 5% per worm per head, if I do, that's going to kill all the beneficials. Therefore, there won't be any beneficials there if we do get sugarcane aphids. That's been quite a dilemma. This year, it wasn't so much because uh, we probably had as small a infestation of sorghum headworms as I've ever seen. Um, so we didn't have that dilemma with uh, reducing the beneficial populations because of treating for sorghum headworms. But just remember, there's some sorghum that's just now starting to head out. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to keep that in mind. Also, the sugarcane aphids are still there. They're still coming in. Again, the beneficials, I assume the beneficials are going to be out there feeding, you know, as long as we have sugarcane aphids. Uh, at least I hope that's the case. And then as soon as it gets cold, and, and in the case of sugarcane aphids, probably just down to frost, you know, in the in the mid to high 30 degree Fahrenheit range, uh, that will probably take care of those. The nice thing about sugarcane aphids and the honeydew, they do produce a lot of honeydew, but as soon as the, the aphids are gone, the honeydew just dries up and it's not a problem. So again, let those beneficials do their thing, but possibly compounding this, Jeff, you say there are chinch bugs out there. Are they enough of a threat to warrant treatment and throw another uh, another issue in here, if you will? Do not forget chinch bugs. <laughs> chinch bugs have been a problem in Kansas since we've had sorghum and corn and wheat, and they feed in grasses for the most part. Every year we have chinch bugs. We had chinch bugs starting out pretty good, but then it started raining. We got some pretty good uh, growing conditions, so most of the sorghum, corn, outgrew the chinch bug damage and the chinch bug feeding. Chinch bugs, they suck the juice out of the plant. They're more problematic during dry years, like a lot of insect damage is. Right now, there are a lot of chinch bugs around. A lot of the growers aren't realizing that, but we're starting to see chinch bug populations as they suck the juice out of the stalk of the plant. And as we continue with the dry conditions, some of the stalks are starting to lodge a little bit or fall over. Um, the ones I've seen have been pretty much just on the border of fields, but just keep that in mind. Right now, there's not much you can do about it other than if you do have chinch bugs, if you know you need to pull the plant, pull the, the leaves around the base of the plant, and you'll see the little red uh, nymphs, chinch bug nymphs, or the gray ones. And if you have those, in, in they're their pretty good populations in your field. That might be the field you want to try and harvest as soon as uh, it becomes um, ready to harvest because if we don't get any rain, especially if we don't get any rain, they're going to continue to suck the juice out of the plant. They're going to continue 
causing problems, and therefore you're going to see more and more lodging in those fields. But chinch bugs, they haven't gone away. They're they're going to be there, and then they're going to go to overwintering sites. They're going to be there again um, next spring. All right. Well, rounding this out, a quick word here on soybean pests in the late going. And two come to mind, you say, right away. The stem borers and bean leaf beetles, are they both present out there from what you're hearing? Yes. Uh, the Decti stem borer from uh, old 77 Highway West in the western two-thirds of the state it is still causing problems. Again, this year is probably not as bad as it has been in past years. But again, if you go out and you have the infestation at 60 to 70 to 80 percent, um, you know, that's kind of what we've seen in the last four or five years. And again, that's there's not much we can do about it. So that's the field you want to try and harvest first because the larvae now, right now, are just girdling around the inside of the of the stem and the plants are wobbly. And as soon as we get some wind, they're going to start lodging and falling over and then they'll be lost. They're really difficult to pick it up at harvest. So if you do have a pretty good uh, infestation of Dectes, I would make that my first priority of harvesting that field or those fields. And bean leaf beetles, we still have bean leaf beetles. Bean leaf beetles are feeding on the pods of the plant. As long as those pods are green, you'll start seeing a little feeding and and it, it just looks like something took a bite out of it because the bean leaf beetle has chewing mouth parts and that's what they do. They take a bite out of it. Sometimes they'll bite it all the way to the bean or the seed inside and that causes some problems with the marketable product, i.e. the bean, right? But the bean leaf beetle overwinters as an adult. Right now there's quite a few bean leaf beetles in the later planted fields, the fields that are greening or are still green, and they're migrating from the earlier planted fields, the fields that have been cut or just are ready to cut. They're migrating to the the later planted fields that are still developing, and they're feeding on the pod, and so therefore they can, they can do damage quite quickly. Again, I did not see any that were at a treatable level, but generally if you have Bean leaf beetles feeding on pods, and you have one per uh, row foot, and the pods are still green, they're still developing. That m- might justify a treatment with an insecticide. But again, this is pretty late in the year, and we did pick up some bean leaf beetle adults in alfalfa, which is where they go to overwinter. So I'm hoping they're mostly leaving the soybean fields and going to overwintering sites, alfalfa or brome or, or someplace else. But In the later planted fields, there are still quite a few bean leaf beetle adults because that's an attractant to them right now. That's where they're feeding. They want to grab a couple bites before they go to overwintering sites. Producers, then, there's just cause to inspect your fields. If it'll be a while before you're harvesting those row crops, the grain sorghum and the soybeans, once more pay attention to alfalfa as well. And that emerging winter wheat, if it gets going here anytime soon. Jeff, good overview, as always, and thanks for the helpful update right here. Thank you. My pleasure. That's crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension, with us on this agriculture today. And Now we'll stand aside and return with more after this break. This is the K-State Radio Network. Make hand-washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, payouts under the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program Phase 1 moved up to $10.2 billion as of October the 4th, according to the Farm Service Agency. That includes $4.9 billion for livestock, $2.6 billion for non-specialty crops, $1.7 billion for dairy, and $743 million for specialty crops. Iowa continues to lead all states with $968 million worth, followed by Nebraska at $715 million, California in the third post, followed by Texas, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Even as producers are reporting already receiving payments under CFAP 2, where enrollment started back on September the 21st, the USDA has not made any payment data available there. CFAP 2 data will be available, says the Farm Service Agency, in the coming weeks. Now, for CFAP 2, the FSA has issued guidance to further clarify who is considered a contract grower relative to eligibility for the program. For CFAP 2, a contract grower is a person or legal entity who grows or produces an eligible commodity or livestock under contract for someone else, according to the FSA. They go on to say the contract grower's income is dependent upon the successful production of a crop or livestock or offspring from livestock. The FSA further noted that a contract grower does not have ownership in the commodity or livestock and is not entitled to a share from the sales proceeds of the commodity or livestock. Now, using that definition, the FSA is saying now that a person or legal entity that raises or grows an eligible commodity under contract and has both ownership and risk of production loss in the commodity or livestock is eligible for CFAP2. That definition is key, the FSA notes, as those signing a CFAP2 application are certifying that they have both an ownership share and risk in the commodity or livestock included on that application. Now, this quick sidebar reminding you that K-State Research and Extension is hosting that webinar tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock on CFAP 2. K-State's Robin Reed and David Shem, Todd Barrows, and Carla Wyckoff from the Kansas Farm Service Agency State Office will break down how those CFAP2 payment rates were determined and what producers can expect for assistance. No fee for participating, but they are requiring registration as it's limited to 500 people, and those spots are going fast, we're told, to register for that CFAP2 webinar taking place tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Go to to agmanager.info. Again, agmanager.info. Another wave of coronavirus-driven closures of meatpacking plants is unlikely because worker testing and safety practices have improved since the spring. That's according to the chief executive of beef and pork processor JBS USA. JBS and other major meat companies have installed automated temperature checkpoints, distributed safety gear to plant workers, and installed partition, uh, partitions between some workstations to catch COVID-19 symptoms and prevent its spread in plants. Those moves came as thousands of employees infected in March and April forced JBS, Tyson, and Cargill, among other meat companies, to temporarily close their plants to stem the outbreaks. Now, JBS CEO Andre Nogura said he's pretty confident that there will be no such disruption that we saw back in April and May. He was sharing those thoughts at the Wall Street Journal's Global Food Forum held on Monday. Well, despite everything, the sponsors of Kansas' largest youth livestock show, including K-State, made it happen. The 2020 show was held on October the 2nd through the 4th in Hutchinson. And right here, Scarlett Hagens has the results. In the Grand Champion Steer Drive at the 2020 Kansas Junior Livestock Show, a 1,360-pound Charlet led by Tyra Mayer of Sylvan Grove captured top honors. Wesley Denton of Blue Rapids owned the Reserve Grand, a 1,370-pound crossbred. McKenna Richardson of Eureka showed the Supreme Champion breeding heifer, a limousine. Reserve Supreme went to a Kianina heifer shown by Darla Fessmeyer from Bartlett. 
A 263-pound dark crossbred shown by Jenna Derushi of Wamigo was named Grand Champion Market Hog. Brendan Anderson of Caney exhibited the Reserve Grand Champion, a 259-pound dark crossbred. The Supreme Breeding Guilt and Champion of the Light All Other Breeds Division was exhibited by Abby Lillard of Abilene. Reserve Supreme Honors went to the Champion Commercial Guilt owned by McKinley Sutton from Uniontown. Bryn Boggs of Bueller owned the Grand Champion Market Lamb, a 152-pound blackface. The Reserve Grand, a 138-pound blackface lamb, was shown by Tyra Mayer of Sylvan Grove. Supreme Register Breeding U Honors went to a South Down shown by Becca Payne from Hutchinson. Reserve Supreme was a Hampshire led by Hannah Whetstone of Howard. Clay Brillhart from Fort Scott owned the Supreme Champion Commercial U with Lakin Rookstool of Wamigo exhibiting the Reserve Supreme. Rookstool also led the Grand Champion Market Goat weighing 69 pounds. The 100-pound Reserve Champion was led by Aaron Johnson of Tawanda. Rainy Garten of Abilene owned the Supreme Champion Commercial Doe. The Reserve Supreme was shown by Kenna Cooley of Lewisburg. KJLS was sponsored by the Kansas Livestock Association, Kansas State University, Cargill, Merck Animal Health, Seaboard Foods, Kansas Farm Bureau and Farm Bureau Financial Services, Friends of KJLS, the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and American Ag Credit. I'm Scarlett Hagens. Thanks, Scarlett, and our congratulations to all. Lastly here, the Kansas Center for Agricultural Resources and the Environment here at K-State will be hosting two tailgate talks next week in Ellis and Russell counties on protecting water sources, cover crops, and other topics. K-State Research and Extension experts and local landowners will talk on those topics, the first of which on Monday the 12th, hosted by the Binder family at Pleasant View Farms near Hayes. That'll feature a look at alternative water sources for livestock use and how to make cover crops work. They'll also talk about existing feed sources in cattle operations. The second event on Tuesday the 13th. That'll be hosted by Rob Corley at his farm near Russell. On that day, uh, speakers will demonstrate how to install a tire tank for livestock use and to discuss how to incorporate cover crops into livestock grazing plans. Now, anybody interested in attending either or both must RSVP do so by calling this number, 785-769-3297, 785-769-3297. This is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. If we had not interfered, would the squirrel foresters have changed the Kansas landscape? That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Here is an observation. If the beaver is the hydrologist, the engineer which builds dams and creates marshes, diverts creeks and rivers and restores wetlands and habitat, then the squirrel is a forester, creating forests where forests were not before, as well as maintaining tree stands by burying seeds and nuts. Over the past year, I've caught eight squirrels in my life trap. I took them to the farm and released them. They like it there. I do not know if the move was traumatic. I never asked. I do it when I do not upset their family life. And I do it because they become so brazen around the bird feeders, it is as if they demand to be fed with their scolding chitter-chatter. So they emigrate. However, during this summer and fall, two squirrels remained. They quite well behaved and keep their distance. They tend to keep to themselves. I've made no effort to trap them in a live trap. 
they do eat the dropped and spilled bird seed. I think that is fair game. But I've noticed something else. It's nothing new. At this time of the year, they're busy digging up the lawn and border and planting acorns and walnuts. This year, it seems to be more than usual. And they do not only bury the seeds in the border and lawn, but also in many of the flower pots and hanging baskets. When I pulled the now dead tomato plant out of its large container, I noticed the tiny leaves of an oak tree in the center of the pot. It's only two inches high. Growing in the center of the large pot, I've pulled the pot aside, and I will try to grow the tiny oak into a tree. Once grown into a sturdy sapling, I will give it away. And someday, someone will enjoy its shade. I will be long gone, but that doesn't matter. Boomp je groot, plantert je dood. Is an old Dutch saying my mom used to say. It means when the tree is big, the man who planted it is dead. However, looking at some of the larger trees I planted, small, here on the hill, that saying is not always true. Of course, the big oaks I'm thinking of are big trees, but not big, big oaks yet. I hope no one will cut them down because they are in the way. They have a good 40 years plus of growth like many of the trees I planted here. 55 years ago, I planted trees in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I wonder about the trees I planted in Australia around the farmstead. I gave my college friend in Australia a wallamy pine tree. It was grown from a cutting of a living fossil believed to have become extinct millions of years ago. It is the botanical equivalent of a breathing dinosaur. The Wallamy pine once grew throughout the southern hemisphere. A bushwalker noticed a small cluster growing in a deep, isolated canyon not too far from Sydney. The location where they were found has been kept secret, but cuttings had been collected and propagated, and the tree is available. I planted one on my friend's property in the bush in what I thought would be a good spot. The wallaby pine can grow in climates as cold as 23 degrees Fahrenheit and all the way up to 113 degrees. Maybe I can try it here, or better yet, down south, near Pinehurst, Texas. It is made available through propagation by nurseries. It prefers well-drained, slightly acidic soils. That is something to keep in mind. But back to my foresters here on the hill. The squirrels, my foresters, take local seed and run around with bulging pouches. They go hither and thither and decide to dig and plant. Their front paws dig frantically, and down they plop an acorn or nut. Maybe two are spit out in the same hole. A little earth is scraped back, and off they run to the next one. They can stay busy for a long time, and I've watched them bearing acorns in the hanging baskets. It's no wonder I find seedlings growing in many of my pots, but not only the pots, all over the yard. If I did not mow, the yard would become woodland. And that gave me the insight that it would be possible for the squirrel to change the prairie and rangeland into a forest of hardwoods, pushing west, coming from the wooded east. It would always be the edge of the forest, ever so slow, pushing further west along streams and valleys and upland. Time is not a factor here. Time has no meaning except a very, very, very long time. But just visualize it as I observe the squirrel here planting an acorn at a time. But here, there are factors today which will make sure that it will never happen. 
never has happened because there was the fire. The grasses would catch fire and it burned all. Trees never had a chance to grow and there was limited rainfall. Also, there were the millions of buffalo trampling seedlings underfoot when grazing the grasses. But as I watched the busy squirrel planting the acorns of my bur oak, the thought struck me it could have happened if there had been no fire. If we had not interfered, would these squirrel forests have changed the Kansas landscape? Over time, a long time, thousands of years. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. We appreciate you tuning in. Please be back with us right here tomorrow, won't you? Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.